Three travelers felt their legs grow heavy as the sun dipped below the mountain peaks. They'd covered 60 kilometers since leaving their band on the coast four days earlier. Only grown men and childless women undertook trading excursions during the wet winter days. The oldest traveler knew each landmark on the route by memory. As they walked through a mountain valley with a carpet of short green grass and gray stone towering on either side, a cave embedded in a rock wall came into view. Approaching the mouth, they communicated their arrival with a call and lifted their arms to communicate that they meant no harm. The glow of fire and rumble of voices emanated from the cave, and when its inhabitants turned and recognized the older traveler, they jumped up with smiles and warm greetings. Although they hadn't seen lowlanders for a couple years, the travelers were welcomed at the hearth and offered warm food. As the guests dropped their burdens, they took in the sights of the cave. The main hearth was ringed by large stones. Several other fires cooked meat and warmed a large band clad in the light brown hides of sheep found only in the mountains. A few jackal furs rested on shoulders to keep the winter chill away. Most people wore jewelry of white, red, and black colored seashells. Animal hides of sheep, gazelle, zebra, and jackal in various stages of processing were scattered around the dry cave. Empty tortoise shells, broken pieces of ostrich eggshell, rhino leg bones, and horn skulls of recently butchered sheep all provided evidence of past meals. Scraps of edible stems, leaves, and roots laid in baskets woven from grass. Two young women scraped fresh sheep hides with specially designed bone tools. A man painted designs into a hide using ochre paste. The travelers' eyes were caught by large nodules of flint, which they hoped to trade for seashells and sand fox furs they had brought. Conversation flowed freely between travelers and hosts. They shared a language and customs. Friendly chatter ranged from gossip about friends and distant relatives to hunting stories. The business of negotiating the exchange could wait until the next day. These sheep hunters lived in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco 82,000 years ago. They wore seashell ornaments from the coast, used formal bone tools, and made stemmed stone tools which characterized human groups in the northwest of the continent. Their way of life was one of the most developed before permanent human expansion out of Africa. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 6, Middle Stone Age of North Africa. Today, we will finish our journey through the Middle Stone Age by exploring the first steps of our species in North Africa. As we've seen, the Middle Stone Age witnessed the appearance of anatomically modern Homo sapiens and signs of growing intelligence before our species colonized other continents. My plan is to cover the out-of-Africa migration in our next episode, even though that process is contemporaneous with and related to the events of today's episode. We ended last time by describing the appearance of microlithic stone tools and ostrich eggshell beads in eastern Africa. This transition to the late Stone Age began around 50,000 years ago, and marked a radical change in technology and social behavior, unseen up until that point in tropical Africa. In contrast, in North Africa, technological innovation and behavioral complexity show up much earlier than in the savannas of Eastern Africa. 
These developments were highly regional and illustrate how the destiny of many human lives was subject to powerful circumstances. Human prehistory in North Africa was shaped by climate more than anywhere else on the continent. The Sahara Desert, which today occupies 25% of Africa, was not always as large or dry as it is today. Cyclical global shifts in rainfall patterns brought tropical rains north into the Sahara Desert. This moisture transformed a large portion of North Africa from inhospitable desert composed of sand dunes and bare rock, much like today, into a vast mosaic of flourishing green vegetation, rivers, wetlands, and lakes. These green Sahara episodes lasted several thousand years at a time. For example, one of the most widespread Green Sahara events took place between 114 and 104,000 years ago, based on geological records from across the desert. In general, the period between 130 and 70,000 years ago, known as the last interglacial, was relatively wet. Using satellite imagery, scientists have been able to map out the courses of prehistoric rivers and mega lakes that covered the region. During wet periods, the savannas south of the Sahara expanded northward, bringing with them much of the animal species typically found in tropical African savannas. Bones of hippos, a species that requires large permanent sources of water, have been found deep in the central Saharan desert. However, the sand dunes and bare rock never completely disappeared, even during the peaks of the Green Sahara, and a narrow strip of desert persisted along the northern edge of its current range. North of this strip of desert, Mediterranean woodlands and grasslands covered coastal mountain ranges and plains. The impact of this transformation on the humans of the Middle Stone Age would have been immense, as a vast portion of the African continent was converted from uninhabitable wasteland to savannas with abundant animal life and many permanent fresh water sources. The Green Sahara provided an inviting frontier for forager bands to move into, and the archaeological record retains evidence of this expansion. Middle Stone Age tools have been found at over 100 sites within the modern boundary of the Sahara Desert, including many locations deep in the central Sahara of southern Algeria, Libya, and northern Niger. Many other sites have been found in the deserts of Egypt, hundreds of kilometers west of the Nile River. Few of these sites have been dated but those that have mostly fall between 130 and 70,000 years ago, during recorded wet periods. The high density of tools found at these sites implies that people lived in the Green Sahara for long periods, probably thousands of years at a time. The location of tools tells us where bands chose to live within this vast region. Unsurprisingly, Many tools are found near the dry beds of ancient rivers and lakes. Even during Green Sahara periods, these grasslands would have only received about 50 centimeters of rain a year, so staying near reliable sources of water would have been critical for foragers. Also, many sites are concentrated around the Hogar mountain range of the central Sahara. Humans probably preferred to live near these mountains just as Middle Stone Age people chose to live in the highlands of Ethiopia and Kenya because of greater precipitation around these mountains and a larger variety of natural resources. So if people were moving into the savannas of the Green Sahara, you may be asking yourself where they came from and what happened to them when the savannas eventually dried up and transformed back to desert. The ultimate origin and fate of these ancient Saharans is a complicated story, and one that we will untangle throughout this episode. The key to answering it is found in the vastly different human groups living at the margins of the Great Desert.
The number of humans living in northern Africa was quite small, and the majority of Middle Stone Age Homo sapiens probably lived in sub-Saharan Africa. When North Africa was extremely arid, human groups only survived in small pockets, which still retained some precipitation or large flowing rivers. There were three main refuges, the Nile Valley, the Maghreb, which is the northwest coast of Africa in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, and Cyrenaica, which is a small mountainous region of the Libyan coast. Archaeological sites dated to North African arid phases are almost entirely restricted to these refuges. Human populations here were isolated from each other for thousands of years at a time, and as a result, their stone tools evolved to be different from each other. In fact, North Africa produced some of the most distinctive regional variations of stone tools from the Middle Stone Age. For example, in Cyrenaica, the size of tools, the method of core preparation, and the shape of tools was highly distinct from other regions of North Africa, and suggests that a unique napping tradition developed here in isolation. One particular practice that distinguished tool makers in Cyrenaica was the frequent use of a specific method for resharpening tools. Referred to as the burn blow, a single strike removed a long, thin flake along one edge of a tool, removing the dull, used portion and leaving behind a nice, sharp, fresh edge. This technique can also be used to produce a multifaceted tool called a burin, which will become very common in later prehistoric societies. During Green Sahara episodes, isolated populations like that in Cyrenaica expanded and came back into contact with each other as they moved along the rising rivers and through the expanding savannas of the Sahara. Despite periods of severe isolation along the north coast of the continent, populations living there did not demonstrate significant biological differences from Homo sapiens living elsewhere. Fossils found in Morocco and Libya that date between 108 and 70,000 years ago share anatomical characteristics with skeletons found in the Levant and Eastern Africa from the same period. One particular morphological characteristic they shared was especially large molar teeth, about 20% larger than average molar teeth today. The shape of their teeth was also different, exhibiting more crests than modern human molars. This morphological similarity suggests that these North Africans had genetic contact with tropical Africa, probably due to periodic migrations across the Sahara during wet intervals of the Middle Stone Age. In contrast, molars were much smaller among humans at the southern end of Africa, suggesting some genetic isolation between those populations and others to the north. While we're on the topic of contact between human groups, it's interesting to note that there's no evidence of contact between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens via the Strait of Gibraltar. No Homo sapiens fossils have been found in Southwest Europe until after the Middle Stone Age, and no Neanderthal fossils in Northwest Africa at any date. Even though our species occupied the coast near this strait as early as 250,000 years ago, it appears that this 14 kilometer wide channel was an effective barrier to interspecies contact for hundreds of thousands of years. The isolation of Homo sapiens populations from each other at the margins of the Sahara led to regional differentiation in customs, guiding the crafting of stone tools. This distinction would become even more evident during the last interglacial period. Under these favorable environmental conditions, people would develop new tool production techniques and adopt greater social complexity. In fact, certain technologies and symbolic artifacts are found in North Africa earlier than in any other part of the continent. So for the rest of this episode, 
as we continue to search for the origin and fate of the Saharan populations, we will take a closer look at the developments within human bands of the Maghreb and the Nile Valley. The Mediterranean woodlands, montane forests, grasslands, and coasts of the Maghreb would have presented ancient human populations with reliable access to key resources throughout the Middle Stone Age. It is within these environments, at the corner of the continent, that human groups adopted new customs with the onset of a wetter climate around 130,000 years ago. People living in the Maghreb had been using prepared cores, points, and scrapers since 300,000 years ago, like those of humans across the continent. But with the improving climate, a new feature of tool design spread between human bands. This addition was a tang, a short round stem, usually about 1 to 2 centimeters long, sticking out from the base of a tool. A tang was an ingenious modification to facilitate the insertion of a stone tool into a wooden or bone handle, in which a hole had been drilled to insert the tang. The strength of this attachment would have made these hafted tools more reliable than previous compound implements. In North Africa, tangs were made on a variety of tools, including small points which have impact damage consistent with their use as hunting weapons. Other tang tools were scrapers and knives, used to cut and process organic material. The size and shape of tangs was remarkably consistent from band to band, probably reflecting a functional optimum. Tanged tools were valued possessions and often resharpened to maintain them over long periods. However, not all tools used by forging groups in the Maghreb were tanged, usually only about 10 to 20 percent, and some groups didn't use them at all. What makes the tangs of North Africa so intriguing is that they are the first documented use of this feature in human prehistory, although it would be discovered again by later societies. This technological innovation was so useful that it spread across the Sahara Desert during one of the wet phases after 130,000 years ago. Tanged tools have been found at dozens of sites in the coastlands and hinterlands of the Maghreb, but nearly as many have been found around the mountains of the central Sahara, and some as far east as Cyrenaica and the Egyptian desert. The wide distribution of such a unique feature has led some archaeologists to equate tangs with the spread of a particular cultural group, called the Aterians, named after a site in Algeria. However, more careful studies have shown that groups of people who adopted the use of tangs had otherwise very different toolkits. So the spread of tangs was at least partially the result of the spread of a useful idea between groups originating from different refuges within North Africa. Even though tang users were probably never a group with a coherent identity, the distribution of tanged tools gives us some valuable insight into the movements of human bands when the Sahara transformed from desert to savanna. The presence of tanged tools at two sites in the Maghreb, dated to around 144,000 years ago, suggests that this invention took place in that refuge a few thousand years before the Sahara became habitable. The subsequent appearance of tang tools in the Sahara suggests that some of the people moving into the Saharan grasslands came from the Maghreb. The bands would have had to follow narrow river corridors, which crossed the strip of remaining desert separating the Maghreb from the savannas to the south. Surprisingly, no tanged tools have been found in sub-Saharan Africa or in the Nile Valley reflecting limited interaction of Saharan groups with those outside. While tangs were the most unique technological innovation in the Maghreb during the last interglacial, it was not the only one. Among bands that made tanged tools, 
it was also very common to produce small leaf-shaped points around 5 centimeters long. These were similar to the bifacial points of southern and eastern Africa. In fact, there is evidence that they developed the use of pressure flaking to produce these points, much like the people of the Still Bay culture did. Pressure flaking allows greater control of the shaping of a tool with bone or antler. This advanced technique required a greater investment of time to produce a tool. Similar bifacial points were also used in the Sahara, but groups there tended to make them about twice as long. A third technological innovation made by the people of the Maghreb was formal bone tools. We've seen these pop up occasionally in central and southern Africa during the Middle Stone Age, but it's here at the northwestern edge of the continent that the oldest and largest quantities of shaped bone tools have been found. Four caves in Morocco, located within a few kilometers of each other, have produced dozens of these implements. None are as intricate as the barbed points of Katanda. Most are shaped like knives or spatulas. The knives were around 12 centimeters long and were used to cut soft material. As with other bone tools from the Middle Stone Age, they were shaped by scraping or napping with a stone and finished by polishing with a soft surface. Spatula-shaped bone tools in one cave in particular have led to an especially momentous conclusion. At Contrabandier Cave, less than a kilometer from the modern Atlantic coastline of Morocco, 62 bone tools have been found and dated to 115,000 years ago. This would make them 25,000 years older than the bone tools found in sub-Saharan Africa. Many of them were shaped like spatulas, which based on observations of modern hunter-gatherer groups, are often used to process animal hides. These tools are ideal for this purpose because they can scrape away the connective tissue on the hide without piercing it. In addition, evidence for hide processing comes from the cut marks on animal bones. The placement of cut marks on bones can be used to distinguish between meat harvesting and skin removal. At Contrabandier, antelope species were butchered primarily for the harvesting of meat, whereas small carnivores, such as sand foxes, jackals, and wildcats, were skinned in order to keep the hides in one piece. The tools and skinning techniques used here display sophisticated leather and fur working skills, probably used to make clothing, among other items. Independent evidence that our species was wearing clothing by this point in prehistory comes from the genetics of clothing lice, which diverged from head lice about 170,000 years ago possibly marking the widespread use of clothing among humans, well before we see the evidence of its manufacture at Contrabandier. People using tanged tools, bone knives, and small leaf-shaped points hunted similar animals as foragers in other parts of Africa. As with many Middle Stone Age people, the hunters of the Maghreb preferred to target medium-sized animals that were not too large to be dangerous but still provided large amounts of meat. Their favorite prey was gazelle, unless they were camping in the mountains where Barbary sheep were more common. But much like on the coast of southern Africa and at Pork Epic in Ethiopia, hunters in the Maghreb exploited a wide range of animals. Along with a variety of antelope species, they also hunted extinct zebra species, aurochs, which are the wild ancestors of domesticated cattle, wildebeest, wild boar, and hares. At some campsites, the bones of as many as 60 species of animals were left behind during the Middle Stone Age. Occasionally, the meat of larger animals such as rhino and hippo was obtained, probably by scavenging or killing weak, isolated individuals. It was also common to eat tortoise, 
and at sites near the coast, there is also evidence of shellfish consumption. The most common mollusks collected from the Atlantic coast were limpets, which are cone-shaped and cling to rocks in the intertidal zone. Although the quantities of shells left behind don't suggest that people were relying heavily on marine resources, the presence of chips on the shells suggest that foragers used sharp stone tools to pry off the limpets from the rocks. Along with limpets, they also sometimes collected mussels and terrestrial snails. One interesting finding is that in a few caves in the Maghreb, there is evidence that people were creating permanent structures at their campsites. The simplest of these are stone-ringed campfires, something which was rare during the Middle Stone Age. Other structures are more enigmatic, such as piles of sandstone slabs about one meter high found inside a cave. In another cave, post holes were dug in archaeological layers with tanged tools. To this, we can add evidence from the Sahara Desert, where post holes were dug to support a windbreak around a campsite. Whatever their purpose, people were investing time and energy organizing their campsites, even though all indications suggest they continue to live highly nomadic lives. Structuring of living spaces is considered to be a sign of modern human behavior. The complexity of the Maghrebian lifeway was not limited to technological innovations or diverse hunting strategies. It also included symbolic activity. The use of red ochre appears in the archaeological record of the region starting 109,000 years ago and is found there at three sites. But the clearest indication that symbolic activity was becoming widespread was the explosion of the use of shell beads as body decoration. This practice appeared here 60,000 years earlier than in southern Africa, and is more widespread than during the Still Bay culture. Shell beads, sometimes numbering in the hundreds, have been found at seven sites within a 1,500-kilometer stretch of the Moroccan and Algerian coast. They were also used over a longer time span than in southern Africa. Shell beads in the Maghreb are dated between 142 and 75,000 years ago, and mostly coincide with wet climatic intervals. The shells used as ornaments were different from the limpets and mussels collected for food. Instead, people preferred the spiral shell of the Nesseria sea snail, a similar species to those used to make beads at Blombos Cave, South Africa. Shells collected for beads on the Maghrebian coast were not from live animals, but as empty shells on the beach. Foragers selected shells with naturally created holes, and in some cases enlarged the hole with a stone tool. The clearest evidence that these shells were used as ornaments is the presence of use wear on the edge of the perforation, consistent with rubbing against a cord. At some camps, crafters altered the colors of the beads, which are naturally white, by darkening them in a fire or by applying red ochre. These beads were valuable possessions to prehistoric Maghrebians. They were transported inland up into the Atlas Mountains as much as 200 kilometers from the coast and 900 meters above sea level. It is likely that beads were traded between foraging groups on the coast and those in the highlands. The only other evidence of personal ornaments in North Africa during the Middle Stone Age are perforated stones found in the Sahara near ancient Mega Lake Chad alongside tanged tools. These small, round sandstone pebbles had been drilled and were probably made into pendants. Unlike southern Africa, no evidence of engraving during the Middle Stone Age has been discovered in North Africa. Interpreting the significance of the Aterian of the Maghreb is tricky. We already saw that tanged tools alone do not represent a cultural group spread across the Sahara. But when we add together the totality of shared customs in the Maghreb alone, including tanged tools, small leaf-shaped points, 
bone tools, and shell beads, do we find bands of people that shared a common identity? On one hand, it's clear that human behavior became more complex during the last interglacial. The spread of technological innovations and the use of objects for personal adornment are evidence of stronger interconnections between forager bands, probably through exchange networks. On the other hand, aside from the use of tanged tools, toolkits are less uniform than those seen in other cultures, such as the Still Bay and Howison's Port. This suggests that Aetherian cultural ties were not strong enough to enforce strict standards in tool crafting. To put the Aetherian into perspective, tanged tools were used in the Maghreb from 144,000 years ago until the end of the Middle Stone Age in the region around 25,000 years ago. While this demonstrates a remarkable technological continuity, it contrasts sharply with the crescents of the Howison's port culture, which were only in use for about 6,000 years. On the other hand, the use of shell beads and bone tools was more constrained than tangs, limited to wet phases of the last interglacial, with peaks around 110 and 80,000 years ago. These signs of complex human behavior in the Maghreb were clearly associated with a favorable climate. As the region dried out, people abandoned these customs. Shell beads were not used during the final period of the Middle Stone Age, between 75 and 25,000 years ago. This pattern supports the theory that greater behavioral complexity was related to a local increase in human population density, facilitated by more abundant resources. In fact, around 130,000 years ago, the number of dated archaeological sites in the region increased dramatically. Living in greater contact with other bands, human groups became linked more strongly and probably adopted symbols of identity to adapt to the changing social landscape. The story of human prehistory in the Nile Valley seems to have followed a different trajectory than that in the Maghreb. Both were refuges for human populations when the Sahara was dry. During green Sahara periods, unlike today, a dense forest formed along the Nile River, which would have provided a strategic location for foraging bands within range of forest, savanna, and aquatic ecosystems. As in the Maghreb, the arrival of a wetter climate in the Nile Valley during the last interglacial saw innovations in stone tool production techniques. But where the use of tanged tools persisted for more than 100,000 years in the Maghreb, the Nile Valley experienced several transitions between styles of stone tools throughout the end of the Middle Stone Age. This might represent the fact that the Nile Valley was an important corridor for human migrations, whereas the Maghreb was only connected to the rest of Africa by narrow river corridors across the Sahara, people would have been able to move into the Nile Valley easily from the Mediterranean, tropical Africa, and the Sahara Desert. It's perhaps the more frequent incursion and contact between diverse groups that led to greater turnover in stone tool technology. Unlike the Maghreb, there are few signs of complex human behavior along the Nile Valley during the last interglacial. At a couple of locations in northeast Africa, bone tools have been found, and aside from rare ochre use, there is no other evidence of symbolic production. This surprising lack of archaeological richness may stem from the deposition of vast amounts of sediment by the Nile over top prime locations for Middle Stone Age campsites, making them difficult to discover. In fact, the majority of archaeological sites along the Nile have been found on elevated terraces away from the river. Most of these sites were not the home base residential camps of foraging groups, but quarries, where they collected stone. Here, small parties dug trenches up to two meters deep 
to extract large amounts of high-quality chert and spent time making tools before heading back to their base camp. The extent of the extraction and the quality of the tool production at these sites has led some archaeologists to speculate that some members of Nile bands were specialist stone workers. The lack of other artifacts means that the story of the Middle Stone Age of the Nile Valley has to be told primarily through stone tools. Let's begin with the wet climatic period that began around 130,000 years ago, when foragers moved out of the Nile Valley and into the surrounding savannas. These groups used a distinctive toolkit, including large, long, narrow points and core axes, along with more traditional Middle Stone Age scrapers and denticulate tools. Similar tools had been used in the Nile Valley going back tens of thousands of years. The use of large, long points and core axes in Northeast Africa has drawn comparisons with the Lupembin tools of Central Africa which were used as early as 250,000 years ago. Some archaeologists argue that this is evidence that the Nile Valley was colonized by groups of Homo sapiens early in the Middle Stone Age, migrating north from the Congo Basin or the Lake Victoria region. Considering the vast geographic separation of these regions, other experts believe that it's more likely that local groups develop similar sets of tools independently from those of Central Africa. One tool that definitely had a local origin in the Nile Valley is called the Nubian Point, which first appeared around 130,000 years ago. These points are especially relevant to our understanding of the human expansion out of Africa, as we will see in our next episode. Nubian points were napped following a highly standardized prepared core technique. It's a variation of the Levallois method, in which the core stone is formed into a triangular shape and then struck to produce an especially long point. You may remember that I mentioned in our last episode that Nubian points were found at several sites in Ethiopian highlands starting 100,000 years ago suggesting a southward migration from the Nile Valley around that date. But at the beginning of the last interglacial period, the Nubian technique in the Nile Valley was only a minor component of an otherwise Lupembin-style toolkit. Whatever the ultimate origin of the Nile Valley technology, groups using these tools followed expanding savannas and growing lakes into what is today the deserts of Egypt and Sudan. At the edge of these prehistoric lakes, they camped and hunted gazelle, buffalo, and tortoise. They used grinding stones, probably to process plant foods from the productive lakeside ecosystem. But these migrations did not end at these lakes, and some groups kept going deeper into the green Saharan grasslands following the growing network of rivers. Eventually, descendants of these groups arrived at the mountains and lakes of the Central Sahara, still using large, narrow points, core axes, and Nubian points. Just as tanged tools were brought into the Sahara from the Maghreb, so were tools characteristic of the Nile Valley. In fact, some bands used tanked tools alongside Nubian points and core axes. They even put tangs on larger points than any made in the Maghreb. This melding of Western and Eastern styles reflects an encounter of very different cultures in the Central Sahara. Foraging groups separated by impenetrable Sahara desert for thousands of years probably speaking unintelligible languages, following distinct customs, met each other, adopted each other's stone tool styles, and probably mated with members of the opposite group. The Sahara was the melting pot of Middle Stone Age Africa. Large, Lupembin-style points were used by groups along the Nile River until about 100,000 years ago. But as North Africa continued to enjoy a relatively wet climate, 
the lower Nile Valley witnessed a technological transformation. By about 88,000 years ago, people abandoned the larger Lupembin-style tools. Instead, Nubian points became the predominant hunting weapon made by foragers. But this was not the only change. People also adopted a slightly different variation of preparing the Nubian core, and they started favoring the use of short rectangular end scrapers. The cause of this change along the northern portion of the Nile River is unclear. Such significant changes were rare during the Middle Stone Age. Some experts attribute this change to the influx of new groups into the lower stretch of the Nile. But the continued use of the Nubian method supports an adaptation by local groups to changing circumstances. Technological change was not limited to the northern stretches of the Nile. Just as Nubian points became common in the north, a very different set of tools were used by foragers further to the south. And the source of this change was much more obvious. Five archaeological sites discovered near the Nile River in northern Sudan have been named the Kormusin culture. These ancient campsites lack concrete dating, but were used sometime between 85 and 65,000 years ago. The Kormusins did not make any Nubian points. Instead, they used a different variation of the Levallois technique, called centripetal core preparation. The centripetal Levallois, like the Nubian technique, has important implications for the movement of human groups between Northeast Africa, the Levant, and Arabia. This technique is called centripetal because when preparing the core, small flakes are removed all the way around the edge of a circular or oval-shaped core. The tool that is finally produced is circular and was usually modified into different types of scrapers and denticulates. The centripetal variation of the Levallois technique was very common in the Ethiopian Rift Valley around 100,000 years ago, at sites that are about 1,500 kilometers southeast of the Kormusin sites. So it's believed that the appearance of the unique Kormusin culture was the result of migrants from the Ethiopian highlands moving into the Nile Valley during the wet phase around 80,000 years ago. Further aspects of the Kormusin stone tools separate them from other groups in the Nile Valley. First of all, they used different raw materials for different purposes. Whereas other groups along the upper Nile use sandstone to produce the majority of their tools, Kormusins only use this type of stone to produce their larger, rougher tools, including burins and denticulate tools. Then, they used higher quality chert to produce tiny blades. Extremely small blades like these are referred to by archaeologists as bladelets if they are less than one centimeter wide. The production of bladelets was only seen occasionally in Africa during the Middle Stone Age and distinguished the Kormusins from their neighbors. Kormusin sites are one of the few along the Nile Valley where artifacts besides stone tools have been found. These campsites were home-based residential sites based on the remains of campfires, animal bones, and shaped bone tools. Also, the Kormusins ground ochre to produce powder. These rich archaeological remains by Middle Stone Age standards hint at the presence of sophisticated human behavior along the Nile, perhaps related to a migrating group's desire to maintain their identity in a new land. After the last interglacial, North Africa began drying up, and by 60,000 years ago, it was receiving less rain than at any time in the last 100,000 years. The savannas surrounding the Nile River disappeared and turned to desert. Most human bands ceased living in the Sahara and migrated to the few places in North Africa with access to fresh water. There is only one archaeological site in the Sahara dated to this dry period. 
in the central Saharan Hogar Mountains, people using a combination of tanged tools and Nubian points lived 61,000 years ago, just as the drying of the Sahara was reaching its most extreme. Amazingly, these remains seem to suggest that some human groups living deep in the Sahara chose to stay put even as the climate became more arid. The mountain range must have received just enough precipitation to make it possible to cling to life. But it's hard to imagine that these foragers survived the subsequent drought-filled millennia. It's likely that some people tried to persist in the homelands of their ancestors and met tragic ends in the process. But many other groups probably chose to upend their life and follow the dwindling river networks until they found stable conditions. One place many foraging groups ended up was at the Nile River. This influx probably resulted in a temporarily high density of people along the river. The only archaeological sites in northeast Africa dated to the arid phase between 70 and 50,000 years ago are along the Nile River and in Cyrenaica. It's during this period that we see the next evolution of stone tool technologies in the region. Again, unlike the Maghreb where stone tools with tangs remained in use even during this dry phase, in the Nile Valley we find the invention of types of stone tools previously unknown in Africa. One of the most interesting innovations was discovered at the site of Taramsa in the lower Nile Valley. Here, people developed a tradition of stone tool production aimed primarily at making long, narrow blades. The technique they used was an evolution of the Levallois technique, common along the Nile Valley during the previous wet interglacial. These blades were around 6 to 8 centimeters long, much longer than the bladelets produced by the Cormusen people. They served primarily as cutting tools, but could have been adapted for other purposes. This blade-based tradition was in place by 56,000 years ago in the Nile Valley and spread east to the Red Sea coast. Around the same time, 50 kilometers west of Taramsa, other groups were also using a similar adaptation of the Levallois technique to produce blades. However, their blades were distinguished by being much wider at one end than the other. Blade-based toolkits were rare during the Middle Stone Age, but common among Homo sapien groups migrating into Eurasia. Therefore, some experts have proposed that the Taramsa blades were a precursor to stone tools found in the Levant a few thousand years later. We will address all of the diverse archaeological evidence for a Homo sapiens migration out of Africa in our next episode. It's interesting that different styles of blades were made at sites very near to each other around the same time. Archaeologists argue that groups moving into the valley during the dry phase from the surrounding savanna led to greater competition between groups and more incentives to develop unique styles of tools. Since the Taramsa blades were made with a Levallois prepared core, the people who made them are still considered to belong to the Middle Stone Age. The transition to the Late Stone Age, which began first with bipolar napping and microlithic tools in eastern Africa around 50,000 years ago, occurred much later in North Africa. It's unclear exactly where and how this new technology took hold in the Northeast. The lack of dated archaeological sites makes it difficult to track. On one hand, clearly late Stone Age tools appear 40,000 years ago in Cyrenaica. On the other hand, Middle Stone Age tools were still used by foragers in the Nile Valley up until 15,000 years ago. The transition is much clearer in the Maghreb, where tanged tools were abandoned and microlithic tools adopted between 25 and 20,000 years ago. The slow arrival of the late Stone Age technological revolution in the northwest corner of the continent 
reflects the strength of the barrier posed by an arid Sahara desert. Having now reached the end of the Middle Stone Age in North Africa, we've concluded our journey from the south to the north of the continent. We started with the appearance of early Homo sapiens and the widespread adoption of points and prepared cores across Africa about 300,000 years ago. After this emergence, human behavior seems to have reached a plateau that lasted for more than 150,000 years, during which the only evidence of symbolic activity was the use of ochre, and the only evidence of regional tool styles was the lupembin of Central Africa. Technological innovations were minor. Then, we saw the evolution of rounded crania about 190,000 years ago in eastern Africa, in the midst of a rather dry, cold climate. But with the last interglacial beginning around 130,000 years ago, a renewed period of change took hold. We saw greater regionalization of tool styles, more common creation of symbolic objects, more sophisticated hunting strategies, greater variation in tool crafting methods, and stronger connections between foraging bands. Human behavior became more sophisticated as wetter environmental conditions allowed long-distance migrations of human groups within Africa. Intriguingly, the evidence of this change is most common along the north and south coasts of the continent. Sophistication in human behavior was neither widespread across the continent nor permanent. The use of personal ornaments appeared, then vanished. Local tool styles emerged, then disappeared. Although there is no doubt that our understanding of the Middle Stone Age is incomplete and will continue to be improved with more archaeological research, it's clear that greater complexity in human culture was sporadic and limited, likely contingent on specific environmental conditions. As we have seen, many different theories have been proposed to explain these pulses of modern human behavior. Among the most popular are evolutionary changes to the human brain and local increases in the human population. This question remains unanswered, but it's during the period of sporadic flashes of complexity that some human bands from Northeast Africa made fateful voyages through narrow corridors into Asia. In our next episode, we will examine the genetic, fossil, and archaeological evidence for human migrations into Asia. This has been our prehistory. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider visiting this podcast's Patreon page and becoming a contributor so that I can continue bringing you our prehistory.